so maybe we can start. So we are honored and pleased to introduce Professor Stolnecker. Um, you all know his work, in part because during the last month we <laughs> did this reading group in which you had a, uh, everybody had a chance to, to get acquainted with his work. And for some of us, uh, it's been, uh, how can I say, uh, constant presence uh, in our mind when we did our research. Uh, I still remember uh, end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, uh, um, inquiry is 1984, when inquiry came out, the, the sense of excitement that was awaiting this book. And uh, uh, so Professor Stonecker actually worked on a number of, of topics. He covered an impressive number of topics, uh, philosophy of language, metaphysics, philosophy of mind, and uh, I'm leaving out uh, <coughs> a lot of the stuff that he did. And so, what can I say? We're very happy he's here. Thank you. Oh, you have already. So I have to turn it off, perhaps. You're already. Okay. Good, am I? Yes, I'm, I'm wired and turned on, it sounds like. Okay, so thanks very much. And uh, thanks also to uh, Elisa for uh, arranging uh, this uh, and giving me the opportunity to uh, explore again, um, continue exploring some ideas um, that I want to try to uh, develop. Before getting to today's uh, topic, which is mainly going to be uh, sort of introductory and setting up, I want to say um, uh, something more generally about what I want to try to do in the, in the, over the next um, today and four more days. Um, it was 50 years ago, really fully 50 years ago, that I first um, wrote about conditionals. And I've been uh, thinking off and on about them ever since. Um, I tried in the first paper in night, published in 1968 to solve a problem, um, but solving a problem is really not quite the right word for it since it's really still not solved. There are many problems and one hopes that, um, that we're making progress in the sense of deepening and clarifying what some of those, sharpening what some of those problems are. But, um, uh, the deepening brings on more problems and there are plenty uh, still remaining uh, to work on. The focus today, uh, during, the, during most of the sessions uh, this week will be on counterfactual conditionals, not on uh, so-called indicative uh, conditionals. But we'll spend some attention, give some attention to that, partly because I think one of my sort of themes is that um, um, the uh, the uh, the indicative conditionals are in a sense more basic, more uh, primitive, uh, and uh, it's a development from them that leads to counterfactuals. Uh, and that uh, there are sort of distinctive problems for each kind of conditional, and um, uh, the uh, differences between them as well as the uh, continuities between them, I think, are helpful for trying to understand them. Um, so uh, and today I'm going to talk some about indicative conditionals in a little bit, uh, but the main focus will be on trying to get it clear on, on um, counterfactuals. I should say just a, a remark about um, the grammatical terminology that has traditionally been used to distinguish two kinds of conditionals called indicative and subjunctive. 
But for several reasons, these even, even linguists have gotten used to this distinction, even though uh, it's really not uh, accurate for several reasons. I remember when I first gave a talk in, uh, years ago, back in the 70s, in, uh, in Sweden, where people studied English grammar in the way uh, um, English speakers don't ever study it. Uh, and they were puzzled because these aren't indicative. You know, this isn't indicative um, uh, and subjunctive. Um, but uh, the terminology has stuck uh, anyway. So one reason why the grammatical distinction is um, not quite right is that uh, the, the, the ways in which the distinction is marked in different languages is different. So in particular, I don't know what it's uh, like in Italian, but I, uh, it's probably more similar to French than it is to English, I assume. In French, I know, is uh, there's a special tense, so-called tense, called the conditional tense. Um, and um, um, whereas uh, and the subjunctive is used for something totally different. Um, in fact, some so called some conditionals, archaic conditionals in English that are strictly speaking grammatically subjunctive, are uh, fall in the category of the indicative as far as the philosoph philosophical distinction or ling grammatical uh, linguistics distinction is, uh, is made. So um, when Patrick Henry said, if this be treason, make the most of it, of course, that's a conditional imperative. But you can construct with the, the, the B, which is a mark, a distinctive mark of subjunctive in English, you can um, um, construct straightforward conditionals, which are epistemic conditionals, or uh, meet all the conditions of indicative uh, conditionals, even though they're in the subjunctive, although that's, uh, that's archaic. Uh, the main distinction in English is marked with tense, not with mood. Uh, and the would, which is distinctive of English uh, so-called subjunctive conditionals, is in effect, so morphologically, a past tense of a future modal, because will is a modal word which is used to express the future. We don't have a future tense, strictly speaking. Um, and it's interesting that in different languages, including French and uh, I know uh, I understand Greek, um, the, um, there's something like the paradoxically sounding past of the future uh, marked in different ways, but it has that feature in both. So in, in French, the conditional, um, so-called conditional, conditionnel, is a um, imperfect past tense ending on a future tense stem. And in Greek, they do it a different way. And in English, we have a past tense of a future modal. Uh, so you know, it's a complicated grammatically, but the distinction is uh, functionally relatively clear to make, even if it's marked in complex ways in the different languages. So I'm going to continue to use the terminology indicative and subjunctive, but it should be understood in this um, 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 not entirely grammatically correct um, terminology. Um, okay, so the, the lectures uh, will be um, exploratory. Um, I'm going to uh, argue for um, some uh, a certain approach to um, the problem, and for um, um, uh, argue against certain other strategies for addressing um, um, the problems, and be concerned both with some, some more methodological issues and some more substantive issues about, uh, about uh, uh, counterfactuals. But mainly, I'm going to bring out as many problems as I try to solve. Um, uh, okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk mostly about the contrast between the two kinds of uh, conditionals and potential connections between them. 
uh, and in particular some of the problems with so-called indicative uh, conditionals. Uh, tomorrow, um, I'm going to look specifically, spend the time on a certain philosophical strategies of analysis, the, which I'll talk a little bit at the end today, um, the reductive uh, strategy, that is the strategy of trying to give a reductive definition or uh, to, to take some philosophically problematic concept and um, reduce it or analyze it uh, to unproblematic uh, notions. So that was the traditional empiricist strategy for dealing with counterfactual conditionals, uh, a strategy that David Lewis developed in a quite different form. Uh, and so I'm going to contrast um, Lewis's uh, strategy. Lewis's analysis, formal abstract analysis of counterfactuals is very similar to mine, but his uh, sort of philosophical foundations for uh, the defense of a theory of that kind is radically different from, uh, from mine. So I'm going to sort of focus to, uh, next time on uh, Lewis's um, strategy and more generally the sort of issue of, of reductive analysis and argue against it, argue that it's a failed uh, project and in fact has uh, mixed um, uh, motivations that don't fit together very well. Um, Wednesday, uh, I'm going to uh, ask, so uh, if uh, we can't give a reductive analysis, um, what do we do? What's the alternative? That is, what, how does one approach a philosophical concept or a family of philosophical concepts that one finds problematic in some sense but that are not reducible. In the same time Nelson Goodman was first writing about counterfactual conditionals in the 1940s, uh, Roderick Chisholm wrote a very similar, a paper with very similar arguments about uh, independently about the same time, uh, arguing against certain reductive analyses and his sort of conclusion in the end was, well, I guess they're primitive. End of story, right? Said, but somehow the idea that either you can reduce something or you can't, and if you can't, it's primitive, and so we just buy it and, and move on. So then, because there's got to be some way to approach a philosophical problem other than to provide an analysis. There better be. Most attempts, many attempts have been made at philosophical definition, um, reductive or limitative definitions. Few have been thought successful. When you look at the history of the analysis of knowledge in terms of justified true belief plus some little addition that takes care of all the Gettier problems and that was an enterprise that went on for quite, one time, uh, for quite some time until people um, uh, pretty much gave up on it but uh, one's got to be able to say things about uh, I mean it's not that one says okay so knowledge isn't a problem after all um, so we have all kinds of arguments for skepticism, various things, which, which show that you know, we, need, um, uh, we need some kind of um, clarification of the concept of knowledge and its relationship to belief and other notions. And if we can't give a reductive analysis, what do we do instead? So I'm going to focus on Wednesday at uh, a certain strategy. It's a very impressionistic and general strategy, uh, but I'm going to try to suggest ways it can be developed more precisely, which is a strategy of um, uh, attempting to um, address uh, what's problematic about the concepts without analyzing them in a reductive way. Um, okay, uh, and the even if we don't reduce um, uh, conditionals, we're going to we want to look at the function that they serve and at uh, the role they play in um, addressing practical concerns. So a lot of the emphasis is on in the first uh, way of developing strategy on the epistemic role of counterfactuals. What is the what role do counterfactual claims play in 
epistemic reasoning um, because the indicative conditionals are explicitly ways of expressing certain epistemic uh, attitudes. Um, uh, counterfactuals are more distantly connected but are still connected to epistemic uh, attitudes. So one of the uh, one of the roles or functions of conditionals one must talk about are epistemic, but um, uh, we're also, also uh, counterfactuals have a very uh, direct uh, connection with practical reasoning, or reasoning about what to do. Um, uh, in deciding what to do, you compare what will happen if you do what you're planning to do with what would happen if you did something else instead. You may know for certain that you're not going to do certain things, which only a nut would do. Uh, but uh, still, they're open to you, and you want to explain why it would be crazy to do those things. And in doing so, you say, what would happen if you did? Uh, so counterfactuals play a clear role in, um, in practical reasoning. And various formal ways of trying to clarify practical reasoning, including uh, Bayesian decision theory and game, particular game theory, um, um, impl involve implicit assumptions about causal and counterfactual structure. Um, and um, so we have some formal theories which concern the application of, of uh, counterfactuals, even though they don't explicitly uh, are uh, developed by appeal to counterfactuals. But um, um, uh, the, the formal theory raises some questions and which, which uh, a theory of counterfactuals helps to answer, and also the theory of counterfactuals raise problems which are sharpened and clarified by looking at their application in uh, decision um, theory. So I'm going to spend some time in the fourth uh, lecture on, um, uh, on um, uh, developing and pointing to the sort of counterfactual, uh, implicitly uh, counterfactual uh, assumptions uh, built into uh, the theory and then at some of the ways in which uh, the different kinds of um, sort of dispositional notions involved um, which, um, which uh, have to do with the difference between practical and uh, the knowledge by dis discovery uh, by evidence and so on. On the one hand, a knowledge by decision. Um, on the other, a decision that's crucial to the decision theory and game theoretic uh, framework. So we're going to look at the practical issues. Um, I mean, not pra practical in the sense of having to do with, with, with um, action uh, and decision uh, in the fourth uh, lecture. Uh, in the fifth, uh, on, on Friday, I'm going to focus on dispositional properties. Um, uh, the original thought was, um, if we had a nice analysis of counterfactuals, the original thought which motivated a lot of the early work uh, by in the positivist and in the philosophy of science tradition of the 30s and 40s, um, was um, the attempt to clarify theoretical concepts in science and the dispositional properties, dispositional predicates, were kind of paradigms of the simplest kind of decision that goes beyond direct uh, evidence, evidential experience. So it was thought that if we had a nice analysis of counterfactuals, we could explain dispositional properties. Uh, but uh, the project of trying to find an analysis of counterfactuals, at least a reductive analysis, didn't succeed. Uh, Nelson Goodman later suggested maybe dispositional properties should be approached directly um, rather than uh, maybe the problem would be simpler than the problem of analyzing counterfactuals. And I think there's something right about that view. So I want to look at the general problem of, of uh, dispositions. Along with thinking that maybe they're simpler, they're, part of that was uh, an, ar an argument that uh, dispositional properties, in fact, can't be analyzed in terms of counterfactuals anyway. 
Um, so they're very counterexamples to a counterfactual analysis of dispositional concepts. There's obviously some connections between dispositions and counterfactuals, but what the connections are um, is less, uh, less than any attempt of reducing one to, to the other. So I'm going to look at, at the general questions, some general questions about dispositional properties and the way they fit into the general strategy I want to defend. And, and but then tying in with the issues about practical reason, uh, I want to look in particular at some dispositional properties of human rational agents which are connected with evaluating their, their actions. So the two kinds of, well, there are many kinds, but several kinds of uh, uh, dispositional properties connected with rationality. Um, there are, in the theory, probabilities and utilities representing degrees of belief and degrees of uh, desirability or something like that. So um, these are properties about what you, th of a belief-like kind and of a desire-like kind. Um, but there's a second kind of, dis a third kind of dispositional property that's involved in action, and those are intentions. Intention maybe is a kind of belief, some people argue, uh, and it's grounded in, perhaps in some sense, in your desires or your values, what you value. Um, but uh, there's something independent or separate about a decision to do something. It isn't just, just um, a, a direct application of the motivational state, but the sort of a move of forming an intention to do something and therefore coming to believe that you will do it. So intentions are a distinctive kind of uh, dispositional property. And uh, in the game theory, you have a notion of strategy, where a strategy is like a complex conditional intention, intention or at least that's one way of understanding um, what it is. So I'll look at the idea on the last day of, inten of, of strategies in a game or strategies in a decision problem, a complex sequence of decision problems, uh, as, um, as a kind of dispositional property. Um, in all this, so we're going to find there's a family of concepts, a family of concepts um, that Hume grouped together under the natural necessity um, category, um, a family of concepts which um, uh, which have conceptual connections between each other. And if we, even if we can't find a reductive analysis of something independent, uh, we can perhaps explore the territory of the relationship between these different, um, different concepts. Um, okay, so that's what we'll do on the last um, uh, day. So, um, conditionals generally as a topic, um, form a basis for connecting a range of different, totally different areas of philosophy. So the issues are metaphysical. I mean, of course, they're semantic, lots of semantic issues and, and issues about meaning uh, and compositional structure and so on involved in the logic of, of uh, conditionals. But the original problem of counterfactuals is really a metaphysical problem, even though the positivists and logical empiricists who developed the early work in this didn't, didn't want to think of it as metaphysics, but it has to do with, it's metaphysical in the sense that what's, what kind of claim about the world do counterfactual conditionals make? What are they saying about um, the world? And again, the reductive strategy is one that says we can, uh, we can reduce the apparently extra stuff that is said about naturalness, the necessary, natural necessary connections between things, we can reduce all that to something more basic. Um, but the anti-reductionist strategy is saying, no, there is uh, our conception of the objective world essentially involves these kinds of uh, connections. Uh, so there are metaphysical problems about conditionals 
there are definitely uh, epistemic, the role, the epistemic role of, of, uh, of conditionals um, is um, on the forefront in with indicative conditionals, but there in the uh, application of counterfactuals as well. Third, practical reasoning, um, uh, moral psychology, whatever you want to uh, call it, um, these issues are essentially connected with, uh, uh, with, uh, with conditionals uh, as well. So we'll look at some of the interaction between those different, um, different things as, as we go. Okay, so um, today um, I want to start by, by exploring two interconnected issues. Um, and, the, and the two issues are first, uh, and this is on the, on the handout. The handout starts with a, um, uh, a minimal pair to illustrate the contrast between the indicative and subjunctive uh, conditionals. And this is uh, the original pair of this kind was due to Ernest Adams. This example is due to Jonathan Bennett. Uh, if Shakespeare didn't write Hamlet, someone else did. Obviously true if, um, if conditionals have truth values. Uh, but it, obviously appropriate to say um, the play Hamlet exists if Shakespeare didn't write it. Somebody did. It didn't just reappear out of nowhere. Everyone will agree with that. Uh, the counterfactual, if Shakespeare hadn't written Hamlet, someone else would have, presupposing that he did, but imagining a counterfactual situation which he didn't. Um, uh, here, um, some people would say this is not only false, but impossible. Um, that is, it's essential to a play that it's written by the person who wrote it. Um, was it Borges who wrote a, um, a story about somebody else writing um, Don Quixote, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, word for word, the same one. But uh, many people would say, no, it's not the same. It's a different one. And it, uh, you could imagine someone writing Hamlet word for word or something like it. Uh, but it wouldn't have been Hamlet. It would have been a different play uh, since the origins of a play are essential to it. So, but um, whether you think uh, it's a necessary truth or not, a necessary falsehood that someone else would have written it, uh, it's at least radically implausible uh, if um, that someone should have written the play word for word like that if Shakespeare hadn't written it. Um, okay, so we have a, a, um, a a, a clear contrast, um, and uh, it raises or helps to raise two questions, which are the second thing on, on the handout. Uh, what is the relationship between these two kinds of conditionals? Um, should we give a unified analysis of conditionals with a an explanation of the difference between them, whatever it is, uh, exactly however it's explained, a difference as, as created by some other difference involved in the interpretation. That is, um, could we say there's a uniform abstract analysis, but two context kinds of contextual parameters which play a role in determining the truth conditions relative to context, which yields uh, a difference. Uh, but the difference is within the context of a unified theory. Uh, so that's one question. Should we give a unified analysis or should we say there are two kinds of conditionals? This one should be analyzed this way. This one should be analyzed that way. Uh, so that's one question. A second question is, the interrelated question is, do uh, indicative conditionals, well, generally do conditionals express propositions or have truth values? Or are they to be explained in some, uh, as a different kind of speech act? Uh, you can ask this question about indicative conditionals, and you can ask this question about subjunctive conditionals. You can give the same answer to the two questions, or you can give a different answer, and that's where the connection comes with the first question. If you give a unified analysis, then you're going to give a unified answer to this uh, second um, question. Okay, so. Um, 
um, whether either or both kinds should be addressed. I mean, you, you think of a, a, a conditional as a, as a distinctive kind of speech act that involves just two propositions, the antecedent proposition and the consequent proposition. Um, and um, uh, then the, what the conditional does is used to perform a conditional speech act of a certain kind. Uh, but you can address not just speech acts about conditionals, but also conditional attitudes. So should you think of, um, if you think of someone believing a conditional, an indicative conditional in particular, do you want to think of this as a case of, uh, first of all, let's explain what the content is, the propositional content of the conditional, and then say believing it is having the belief relation to that proposition. So one could give a unified account of belief and other propositional attitudes, and as attitudes taken toward a certain propositional content, have, uh, and, and um, um, so the, the task of explaining a, a conditional attitude is the task of um, simply applying an attitude to, the, to a certain kind of proposition. Or you can think of there being distinctive attitudes of um, uh, which, which don't take a single propositional content but a pair and express some attitude about the relationship between those pairs. So in particular, conditional probability, uh, where probability is understood as degree of belief, is, um, is uh, a doxastic or belief kind of belief-like attitude uh, which you need to explain in terms of the relationship between two, um, two propositions. On some uh, most straightforward use, uh, applications of probability, um, the a conditional probability is, relate, is defined in terms of absolute probabilities. It's a ratio of the two, but it's not defined in terms of a probability of a proposition of any kind. It's the kind of thing that gets an absolute probability. Um, uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, the question, the one question. Um, um, so I'm interested in, um, one of the reasons I want to try to connect, uh, the, one of my sort of motivations for looking for a uniform, a unified analysis for answering the second question in a uniform way, um, is that I'm interested in whether the relation between the two kinds of conditionals can help us um, to help to use each to clarify the other. Um, second kind of question I'll be interested in is what's at stake in the debate between uh, uh, the debate about whether conditional statements have truth values. Um, I mean, there's a question whether, um, I mean, as I say, we're interested in the metaphysical question of what does a conditional tell us, and what kind of claim does it make about the world? But the very idea that it makes a claim about the world is itself uh, subject to, uh, to debate. Even the ardent defenders of a non-truth conditional account of counterfactuals, such as Dorothy Edgington, the most just sort of prominent defender of the no truth value view of both kinds of conditionals is wants to say there's something objective about the world that a counterfactual expresses. Um, so uh, the metaphysical question will still arise, um, and uh, um, but I think um, it's clearest. Uh, it's the clearest motivation for a truth conditional account that it helps to uh, make uh, clear what that objective uh, feature of the world is. Now it's well established by our first example of a minimal pair of uh, conditionals, the Shakespeare example, that there is a semantic difference between the two kinds of conditionals in the following sense. Um, I mean, to say there's a semantic difference doesn't mean they get a separate 
semantic analysis, it means that they may get a, uh, the same semantic analysis with a parameter um, which determines a different proposition, if it's a propositional uh, analysis for the two cases. But there's a clear semantic difference in uh, the following sense. And again, this is neutral between the propositional and the non-propositional ways of handling uh, the examples. Is that the difference between the two kinds of conditionals um, um, in some cases are cases where uh, the same uh, propositions seem to be expressed by the antecedent and the consequent of the conditional. That is, Shakespeare didn't write Hamlet and someone other than Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, which are the, or someone other than, um, yeah, someone other than, than Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. Uh, these are propositions that seem to be the same uh, expressed by the antecedent and consequent of both the subjunctive and the indicative uh, conditionals in this pair. So the uh, component parts express the same proposition, but um, um, but the, uh, it's clear that, to put it in a more neutral way, that um, one of them is assertable and the other is not. Uh, one of them is assertable and in some theor on some theories true, uh, whereas the other is appropriately denied and some would say false. Um, so that's a common ground for everybody in this dispute, but that's where the agreement stops. Some theorists would give separate and independent analyses of the two kinds of conditionals. So just to give, give some names to the, um, this strategy, Alan Gibbard uh, has gone so far as to say that uh, the linguistic uh, similarities between the two kinds of conditionals is, quote, little more than a coincidence, unquote. Um, so uh, Gibbard wants to give a non-truth conditional analysis of indicative conditionals and a propositional analysis of subjunctive or counterfactual conditionals. David Lewis, who famously defends a propositional analysis of, um, uh, of uh, counterfactual conditionals, also wants a propositional analysis of indicative conditionals, but a different one. In particular, he defends the material conditional analysis of indicative conditionals, arguing for a pragmatic kind of Gricean explanation for the, um, um, the, uh, the facts, the, the paradoxes of material implication, the facts that it's inappropriate to assert them uh, on the basis of the falsity of the antecedent. Um, okay, so um, that's the Lewis um, um, view, um, and his account of the subjunctive is similar to the one I want to defend, although not exactly the same, uh, what he calls a variably strict uh, conditional analysis, a modal analysis uh, in terms of, um, that it would, would says roughly that a proposition is, counterfactual proposition is true, in a given possible world, if and only if the consequent is true in, the, in all of the nearest, in some sense to be explained of nearness, uh, possible worlds in which the antecedent is true. Um, okay, others, um, including both Dorothy Edgington on one side and me on the, on the other side, arguing for some kind of unified analysis, um, um, of uh, where the, ex the difference between the two is, as I said, explained in terms of the sort of difference in a parameter. Now, the two issues, whether conditionals of either or both kinds express propositions and whether the two kinds of conditionals should be given some unified analysis are connected in the following, at least in the following uh, way. The case for the no truth value uh, analysis for the conditional, uh, the expression of conditional belief or conditional assertion kind of account is strongest for indicative conditionals. Uh, the extension 
of the no truth value or no proposition analysis to counterfactuals is much more difficult and convoluted. Um, um, but both Dorothy Edgington and earlier um, uh, Ernest Adams still wanted to defend a non-truth conditional analysis of, of, um, um, of um, um, subjunctive conditions. So the case is strongest um, uh, for the indicative, whereas when one turns to truth conditional analyses, the um, even though there are lots of problems with pinning down um, the parameters you need to interpret uh, conditionals, at least the, the sort of um, plausibil intuitive plausibility of a proposition analysis for counterfactuals is much more straightforward and stronger. It seems clear intuitively that a counterfactual, even though it may vary, it may be context dependent in many ways, it aims to state a fact about the world. Um, it lay, aims to say something about dependencies between facts in the world, something that could be true even if we were wrong about it in the way in which there's a distinction between truth and falsity on one hand and justified and unjustified, reasonable and unreasonable uh, on the other. Um, which is uh, sort of stock and trade of a kind of realist view of language. Right? Say whether something's actually true is a different question than whether one has good reason um, to believe it with, counter with divergences on both sides, both things that are false, but uh, because of misleading evidence, reasonable to believe, and things that are true, but uh, because of um, misleading evidence, uh, unreasonable to believe, um, or the absence of evidence in that case. Um, uh, so that's an obvious distinction. It's a distinction that one wants for counterfactuals, and Dorothy Edgington would agree when one wants it uh, for counterfactuals. Some distinction between what's correct in some sense and what's, uh, what's justified or reasonable. Um, something that motivates a more objectivist view of a propositional view. So, um, sort of the, the, the default position is truth conditional about counterfactuals, uh, non-truth uh, conditional about uh, indicative conditionals, and the defense of the unified theory requires different work for the, defend, uh, the uh, truth value people and the non-truth value people. The reason a propositional analysis of um, of indicative conditionals is problematic um, um, is, as we'll see, and we'll look at some examples, um, the um, uh, indicative conditionals are not just context dependent, but extremely fragile in, uh, in, a, in the sense that change the context just a little bit, change the epistemic situation of a, uh, of a speaker or a, uh, the speaker in a, uh, the common ground of a speaker and addressee, change it just a little bit and uh, the truth conditions uh, for a truth conditional analysis change. So um, when you have uh, extreme uh, l dependence on local uh, contextual facts, uh, you get uh, a truth conditional analysis which doesn't yield a kind of stable object, a stable proposition um, that you can take away from the context and say, well, one of the things I learned when somebody asserted this conditional, I learned a certain fact which I now can take away and apply in other contexts. Um, so one could ask, what's the point of a truth conditional analysis if it doesn't yield stable objects of um, uh, with which we can describe the world. So that's, um, uh, that's uh, an issue which sort of pushes toward a non-truth uh, conditional uh, analysis. Um, um, okay, so I have, um, when we look at the question about indicative conditionals, 
uh, over the years I have been on both sides at different times of this issue. So I originally defended in the 1970s an analysis, uh, just an application of the analysis applied and motivated mainly by counterfactuals with a change, with a particular contextual uh, assumptions to explain the distinctive features of indicative um, conditionals. But um, I, I found Alan Gibbard's arguments against uh, a truth conditional account uh, very persuasive and later argued that at least in, in a, my book, Inquiry, uh, at least in, um, uh, at least there's no detachable proposition, nothing that sort of can be detached from the context. So, so sort of suggesting a kind of non-truth conditional analysis was the best one. But since those, that variation, uh, it's now my subtle view that both sides is the place to be. So my hope is that we can bring the two kinds, and this is what I argue in the paper that some of you read um, called indicative, uh, or rather um, conditional assertions and conditional propositions, that we can bring the two kinds of analyses together and to show, this is an ecumenical strategy, but to show that there's less difference um, between, um, between the two analyses than there appears to be. Uh, in the end, I want to buy, I want to stick with the idea that the context dependence with indicative conditionals, at least in many cases, is extremely fragile and we don't get anything um, stable to take away. That is, if you look back later, after a debate uh, in which two people made, say, contrasting indicative conditionals and ask who was right, in some cases the answer is, that question no longer arises. Uh, we can't now, we're not in a context anymore where we can express that, uh, those, uh, those propositions. They were local uh, in a certain uh, way. But that doesn't apply to all indicative uh, conditions. And I think it's uh, the motivation for sticking with the proposition analysis that I think it's important to try to bridge the gap between a conditional assertion and a propositional account and to find some continuity between uh, the transition from one to the other. This is partly in the interest of clarifying the relationship between uh, indicative and subjunctive conditionals and seeing how we can use the sort of epistemic features um, of an indicative conditional to help clarify the criteria for uh, um, uh, evaluating or assessing um, 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 counterfactual uh, conditions. Um, okay, I'm running short of time here, but um, um, we can give, as this is on the second uh, page of, of the handout, uh, just to sort of sketch the idea of a specific conditional assertion account uh, and a specific, more specific propositional account uh, and uh, pose them within a, co a common framework so that we can look more precisely at the relationship between the two kinds of, of analysis. Um, um, so, um, the idea is that the speech act, this is again top of the handout, the speech act of categorical assertion, categorical assertion is a proposal, this is on the uh, sort of looking out the speech act side of it, a proposal to change the context represented by the set of possible worlds in the context set, which is the possibilities compatible with uh, our common background presuppositions, um, to change it by adding the information that the content of the assertion, uh, which is the content of the assertion, to the context. So this is the um, uh, classic um, um, context change analysis of, um, of assertion in a proposition, in a, um, in a, 
uh, for a categorical assertion. And you say, when you have a, a conditional assertion, you begin with an assumption or s supposition. You, s you don't assert, uh, you, you add the antecedent to the context, not by, on the basis of asserting it, but rather simply asking you to suppose it. So it's a temporary uh, supposition. That creates a, what's sometimes called a local context, a temporary local context. Um, uh, and then in that context, you assert the consequent, um, eliminating the possibility in the same way you would with the categorical, but in the, in the derived uh, context. So it's like sequester the possibilities incompatible with the antecedent to create a temporary context, make the assertion in that context, and then add the, the original ones back again. Um, the effect of this is exactly the same as the effect of, um, of asserting a material condition. And that helps to explain some of the close similarities between uh, assertion of a, with certain um, hypothetical qualifications, uh, the, the, the assertion of an indicative conditional is very similar to the assertion of, a, um, uh, of an indicative uh, conditional. Uh, but um, the Speech Act account explains it in a somewhat different way. Uh, different way. In particular, it doesn't apply. You can't assert, um, uh, make a conditional assertion on the basis of um, uh, the false belief in the falsity of the antecedent. Uh, so it helps to explain the differences between indicative conditionals and material conditionals at the same time as explaining the closeness of them. So that's, that's the kind of... Uh, then added to that, to tie it in with the notion of conditional belief, is the defenders of conditional assertion, uh, kind of kind of like Dorothy Edgington and, and Ernest Adams, argued that the, in general, the, um, the assertion conditions for a categorical assertion are the probability of the content is high. So if the probability of the content is high, high enough, depending on your assertion context and so on, then you're, in a, you're justified in asserting it. Similarly, if the conditional probability is high, then you are in a position to assert the, um, the make the conditional um, assertion. Ernest Adams went on to develop a logic of con the conditional on the basis of the conditional assertion account, where the rough idea of the logic was uh, a conditional uh, inference uh, is, is a good inference or so a sound inference if uh, by making the probability of the premises high enough, you can always raise the probability of the conclusion to as high as you like. Uh, so you make them as high as you want, less than one, uh, and you can make the consequent, the conclusion uh, so the uh, argument is valid just in case you can do that for that, that argument. The probabilistic account of um, validity that Ernest Adams gave coincided with, uh, extensionally, with ordinary validity, truth conditional validity, for the case where the premises all express propositions. But in the case where some of the premises are conditionals which don't express propositions in his account, um, uh, you get uh, a notion of validity that doesn't that where the truth conditional one doesn't apply. Okay, so that's the uh, sort of rough idea of the truth uh, conditional uh, analysis. The rough idea of the propositional analysis, which we'll look more at um, later, is that that um, on my uh, version uh, of this account is uh, you interpret the conditional relative to a selection function which selects for each pair consisting of a possible world and a proposition suggests a world which is intuitively the way things would be if the antecedent were true. That's to put it in a kind of circular way, but that's the uh, idea. And 
the uh, aim of the proposition, and then the condition is true, just in case the consequent is true in the closest world in which the antecedent is true. For Lewis, it's a set of worlds rather than a single one, but otherwise um, close to the same idea. Now, on my way of understanding the abstract propositional analysis, uh, the aim was not to reduce counterfactual conditionals to something more basic, any more than a Kripkean account of necessity as truth in all possible worlds is a reduction of modal notions to non-modal notions. Po what are possible worlds? On Kripke's view, they're counterfactual situations, they're ways a world might be. One uses modal notions to explain what possible worlds are. So what is the point of such an analysis? Quine was quite scornful of this. He thought, I thought we were supposed to understand what counterfactual situations were. By, by doing the semantics, and here you're using them to say what your appar formal apparatus is. But the aim was to bring out and uh, clarify the abstract structure and the logic um, of, of conditionals, not to reduce them to something else. So explaining necessity as truth in all possible worlds helps to clarify why the quantificational structure, the parallel with uh, the relationship, dual relationship between existential and universal corresponds structurally to the correspondence between possibility and necessity. There's more to it than that. And interaction with quantifiers is, is, is part of it. But you, the analysis can be, can clarify philosophical problems even if it's um, got this sort of circular um, um, uh, element to it. Uh, so the aim was to, um, to, uh, to give a uh, really overtly circular in a way, in terms of the problematic nature of the concepts involved, uh, analysis, but one that, uh, one that revealed the logical structure of, uh, of counterfactual and other kinds of, of, uh, of conditionals. So the further project, it's sort of, is our way of setting up the further project of saying, so what do we mean when we talk about the nearest possible world or a nearest possible world? What does it, what does it mean? Well, don't make any gratuitous uh, changes. Find a world which leaves everything the same as much as you can. Well, what does that mean? It turns out, you, as, as Goodman's analysis revealed early on before all this, you can't change anything without changing all, all kinds of other things. And uh, we need some kind of a criterion for doing that. Goodman gave up on finding that criterion, Lewis, and uh, thought we could give a further reductive uh, explanation of, of that. Okay, if I have time, I mean, again, this is all just kind of trying to set up and we'll talk more about the, the details of, of these, uh, these analyses um, in the next few uh, days, but um, I want to just to end with um, citing the traditional strategy in general for explaining a philosophical problematic concept. The strategy was, again, the reductive strategy, which is what I'll talk about uh, next time. So the, um, uh, this is quoting Goodman now in, in uh, the sort of middle chapter of fact, fiction, and forecast, I, a philosophical problem is a call to provide an adequate explanation in terms of an acceptable base. If we are ready to, uh, uh, to tolerate everything as understood, there's nothing left to explain. While if we sourly refuse to take anything even tentatively as clear, no explanation can ever be given of anything. What intrigues us as a problem and what will satisfy as a solution will depend on the way we draw the line between what is already clear and what is in need of, uh, um, uh, what is already clear and what needs to be uh, clarified, uh, that should be clarified, not qualified. So the absence of any, in the absence of any convenient and reliable criterion of what is clear, the individual philosopher can only search his philosophical conscience. This talk of conscience is simply 
a figurative way of disclaiming any idea of justifying these basic judgments. But this seems to me to give up too soon on the explanation of why something is problematic. Even if a general criterion of drawing this line might, uh, uh, one might expect some, uh, one might is, is uh, even without a general criterion of drawing this line, one might expect some account of what it is about a particular concept that makes a, it philosophically problematic. Um, but one of the virtues of reductive analysis, if you give a reductive analysis, I don't know it's really a virtue, but um, if you give a reductive analysis, you don't have to explain why your problematic concept was problematic. It's not problematic anymore, so long as the things you reduce it to aren't problematic, because that's all that's left when you give a reductive analysis. So reductive analysis is a way of solving problems without saying what the problems are, uh, without the need to say what the problems are. But we can say more. You have to say more if you're going to solve it in some other way. And we can say more about the empiricist tradition, and you find, is skeptical about objective modal concepts, natural necessity, and possibility, in contrast both with subjective modal concepts, which are explained in terms of, um, to use, uh, in, in terms of belief and sort of attitudes, subjective attitudes. Um, on the one hand, and uh, semantic modality on the other. Modal concepts are to be explained in Herm, uh, to use Herm's, uh, Hume's language in terms of relations of ideas, not matters of fact. They're not in the world, they're in the mind. Um, semantic connections. So uh, one can, uh, 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 the idea of natural, the skepticism that, that lies behind the empiricist project is rooted in the judgment that necessary connections in nature are not observable. Uh, one can observe what happens, but not what has to happen in any sense of must, uh, what must happen in any sense of must. One can observe regularities in nature, but not connections between facts. The empiricist project then is to explain empirical modality by reducing it or factoring it into logical and semantic modality on the one hand, and modal matters of fact on the other. So next time, I'm going to start by looking at the specific project of reductive analysis developed by Nelson Goodman in the 40s, and why it failed on his own terms, why he regarded it as um, a failure. Uh, but Lewis came along and said, uh, we can do better. We can accept the demanding uh, requirements of reductive analysis, but with richer tools, we can still succeed in reducing natural necessity to mere matter of fact. So I think that's a misconceived project, and that's what I'll argue for next time. So thanks. Questions? Giuliano? Uh, yeah. Shall I use the mic? Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I was just wondering whether you could say something more about the, uh, this analogy between the analysis of modality in the Kripken framework and the analysis of uh, uh, conditional in the propositional. Uh, way, uh -huh. because I mean, it seems to me that there is intuitively this kind of this difference. So you point out that uh, uh, circularity is not a problem in the in the Kripkean analysis of modality. Uh -huh. uh, in a sense, one could in understand this by having uh, by understanding the whole framework as a framework in which uh, you don't really have an analysis. You just have like uh, you you buy into a primitive concept and then you use uh, some other framework to explain the behavior of this concept or something uh -huh. like that. May maybe if we want to call it that an analysis or not, that's probably not uh -huh. that, no, not really interesting. No, good. No, you got it. I think so. Uh, this is connected with the idea of. Um, 
with, with the question, if you're not going to give a reductive analysis, what, are you, what else are you going to do? Yeah. And I think if you look at the whole family of problems that arose that led Quine and others to criticize modal logic, uh, first of all, the thought that there was a use mention confusion lying behind um, the, uh, the, uh, um, the move from, uh, and this is, again, another kind of analogy with the Humean uh, uh, project, uh, I, there was a kind of confusion of something semantic, a semantic relation between propositions uh, or between sentences, uh, on the one hand, um, the first grade of modal involvement, and moving it into a, an operator, where an operator is supposed to take the values of, um, of sentences uh, into the values of some more complex uh, sentences. So um, the first move in going to modal semantics was to give some explanation of what the, to, to agree with Quine that we wanted to treat modal operators as operators on values, truth values wouldn't do anymore as they could in an extensional theory. So we need a, a richer kind of value. So we construct a richer kind of value, namely propositions, which are sets, represented as sets of possi possibilities. But you say, but now you're not addressing the substantive metaphysical issue about modality. You are only, um, you're only explaining what is the structure, the relevant structure of the values which are going to be compositional in your, in your theory. So you can give a compositional semantics then, uh, which explains how these modal operators are, uh, are, are values. Mm -hmm. And um, then the second big worry that Quine had was, came from the interaction of, with uh, quantifiers. And that brought additional um, worries about use mention ki kinds of concerns. So you think of possible worlds as uh, ways things might be which have, uh, which do for a, po you have to do in your semantics for a possible world what you do for the world in an extensional theory. So you say, well, we need a domain of individuals. And that raises philosophical problems about what is the domain of individuals, but you can separate those from the technical problems of saying, so how exactly do the semantic values work when we combine the quantifier card theory with the, uh, with, with the uh, propositional modal theory? And you had then a lot of the puzzles, say, about, you know, bicyclists were essentially two-legged but uh, not essentially rational or something like that, yeah, but yeah. human beings are bipeds. Quantifying bipeds quantifying. Anyway, so these sort of puzzles or the puzzles about uh, the, uh, the essential property of being a number and not the number of planets and so on. So, so all these puzzles, referential opacity puzzles, uh, they weren't sort of reduced to anything, but they were clarified. Uh, and you could explain why certain, uh, w exactly where does an inference go wrong to a fallacious conclusion in one of the kinds of arguments Klein was, uh, was taking as reductio ad absurdum of the thing. So, um, so again, the logical structure then helps to reveal this. And the same thing that goes on with, with, uh, with counterfactuals. So in particular, um, it's an interesting fact that Goodman, and we'll talk about this next time, but um, he gave a circular analysis, uh, really as a kind of, in the, at the end of his article about counterfactuals, really as a kind of rhetorical way of giving up. So he said, well, maybe we should make this move. And then he introduced a, what he called, an, um, a, what he thought of as a problematic notion itself into the resources for explaining Counterfactuals, but now our analysis is counterfactual is, is uh, circular because we've used this notion of cotenability, where cotenability of the relevant conditions and so on is a matter of um, counterfactuals. And you say, so that's no good. And he said, so he gave up. If he'd taken one more step, he could have say circular analyses don't necessarily uh, say nothing. Um, in fact. The cotenability analysis developed in certain ways yields a logic of conditionals. 
which is pretty much like, the, depending on exactly the details of how you do it, with the logic that I uh, had and that Lewis uh, came up with. So if, if Goodman had thought analysis isn't the only thing, but revealing logical structure is a helpful uh, notion, then uh, he, he might have gone in a quite different uh, direction. But in fact, his way of proceeding after giving up on the reductive analysis is quite a different uh, okay. thing. Okay. Uh, may, may I add just, yeah. uh, just for, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think my, my worry was that uh, there might be uh, so different with the two cases. So, uh, so in the sense that uh, in the case of uh, of uh, uh, just the, the modal notion of uh, of uh, uh, possibility and, and necessity, one might think that we we sort of have like an independent pre theoretical grasp of what could be a um, you know a fact to be a necessary fact or a contingent fact or maybe a property to be such that being instantiated in a, in a contingent way rather than a necessary way. Uh, whereas the notion of conditional seems more like inherently relational and inherently conceptual in a way. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So if it's in more inherently conceptual, it looks like that, uh, uh, I mean, even, even granting that, uh, you know, you can do more or less the same thing so you can, you know, elucidate the logical structure of the notion. Uh -huh. uh, it looks like that then, I mean, my, one might have more worries about the circularity of the, of the analysis in the yeah, sense that yeah. uh, if it's inherently conceptual and inherently uh, concerning the, the, the relation between concepts, then it looks like that uh, the kind of uh, uh, um, elucidation that you, you you may do there is I mean the circularity might be more vicious in a way there. Yeah, I yeah. mean that, that's I mean it's a, sort of a gut feeling. I'm not uh, not sure exactly how to put it, but I, I don't know if you f see the worry. Yeah, good. Okay. No, it's certainly right that far more is um, uh, is being taken for granted. In a I mean you have a very rich uh, relational structure that you need. Um, whereas, um, a space of, poss a, po a possibility space, um, as an abstract notion is, um, in some ways more familiar. I mean, it's something that's part of, uh, lots of other, it's sort of the, and it's, it's much more minimal. And it's of course presupposed as well by the conditional and by any probability notion. So if you say a probability space is a space of possible worlds, um, so it's a much more, um, first of all, it's a simpler structure and it's, um, although when you add the relational structure that Kripke added to, uh, then you get something that is more sort of motivated by, the lo by finding a model theory for the logic. When, when, uh, so, but, you know, sort of a straight S5 modal logic is a pretty simple uh, structure, whereas conditional logic is a much more complex. But the general strategy, and this is a strategy which we'll see in decision theory as well. If you ask the question, um, what do we need to take for granted in order to make sense of this? And uh, let's just take it for granted and then spell it out. And then... Um, instead of explaining the counterfactual directly, or the probability notions directly, whatever, let's explain the, um, the resources we use to, um, uh, to, to, exp to, 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 to explain it. So in decision theory, you say, well, you, know, you don't have a decision problem until you have degrees of belief and degrees of utility, right? You don't have a game unless you have all this elaborate structure. Um, uh, and once you have it, then you can ask, so what should you do? But then you can also step back and say, where do those things come from? So what, what do we mean by utility or, or probability? And the same thing with, uh, so it's partly a matter of just division of labor rather than, uh, and I think it's right that there's a, maybe an asymmetry here in, in how much of this big family of problems one is solving by doing the, uh, the logical part. Thanks.
Uh, I, I wanted to ask for a, an example of a fragile uh, indicative condition. And in particular, uh, you said that in certain cases, uh, a question about the content of the indicative conditional cannot be raised afterwards. Uh -huh. I wanted an example of this kind of yeah, okay. condition. Yeah, so um, one of the examples most discussed in the literature on uh, conditionals is the Alan Gibbard's famous example of uh, the Mississippi River boat, and we'll talk more about this uh, one of these days anyway. Um, um, so you have a case where, it's really a case where you have two people with partial information. So there are three possibilities. One of them is a position to rule out, I'll describe the example abstractly and then look at the case, but uh, one, one person is in a position to rule out one of the possibilities and the other person is in a position to rule out a second of the possibilities. And if you pool the information, then you get the, that is, the third one is the right, right one. Um, but one uses conditionals to express uh, the information. So the story is um, um, uh, Sly Pete is playing in a, he's a crooked poker player on the Mississippi River boat, and he uh, is, um, uh, Mr. Stone has made a bet, and Sly Pete can either fold or call, and um, uh, one of the players knows, but one of the um, observers knows both hands. So he knows who is going to win. And so therefore he knows that if Pete called, he lost because Pete has the losing hand. The other uh, informant or observer knows, doesn't know both hands, but knows that Pete knows both hands because he's cheating. He knows that uh, he, he knows what the other guy's hand was. So therefore, he would call only if he had a winning hand. Uh, because he knows whether he has a winning hand and he knows he would lose if he called with a losing hand. Um, so one of the people can rule out the possibility that he calls and wins. And the other person can rule out the possibility that he calls and loses. But neither can rule out the possibility that he calls. So the one person says to our um, our narrator of this story, if Pete called, he won, and the other says, if Pete called, he lost. And both seem to know what they're talking about, and the uh, narrator trusts them both, and so therefore draws the conclusion that Pete folded. That seems to support a material conditional analysis, in a way, that is, I would explain it, but uh, so would the conditional assertion kind of, kind of account. But now, in retrospect, you look back after the game is over and say, well, who was right? Well, that suggests that one of them must have been wrong. But one of them wasn't wrong because nobody made a mistake. Each one was basing their claim on a fact which they were aware of, together with facts of which they were ignorant. But it isn't that the facts of which they were ignorant settles the question, because um, both players were quite aware that the facts could have been as they were. So this is a case where a retrospective judgment, which of those two conditionals which seem to conflict uh, intuitively, um, in a logical sense, which of them was correct? And you say, that question doesn't arise anymore. Now, I mean, that's a kind of laboratory case of this, but it can arise in more um, other kinds of, um, of uh, situations as well. So, I mean, Dorothy Edgington, who 
particularly writes interestingly about retrospective assessment, um, points to indicative conditionals where you do get a retrospective assessment. And where, and these are the cases which contrast with the main case on the handout, the first case on the handout here, which is a case where indicative and subjunctive seem to express very different propositions. Um, uh, she wants to say, in many cases, you, somebody makes an indicative um, conditional statement, and then retrospectively, we say, uh, as her example, which is an example where there's a, um, um, a fortune teller tells her that she, if she takes this plane, she'll be killed. Um, um, reading it in the tea leaves, and sh she dismisses this as ridiculous, and, but her car breaks down on the way to the airport, so she misses the plane. And then the plane crashes, and well, everyone was killed. And she says, my God, she was right when she said, if you take this plane, you'll be killed. Uh, and she puts it, expressing it herself, echoing why she was right. My God, she was right. If I had taken that plane, I would have been killed. So this is a case where a counterfactual is used to make a retrospective judgment about an indicative. So it sort of points in the opposite direction from the, uh, from the case where the conditional say something quite, um, quite different. Um, 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 with a Shakespeare example, it would be hard to come up with a case where uh, a retrospective in ju judgment might yield something different about the indicative, but um, because it's so um, perhaps a necessary truth, but, uh, but they're similar. I mean, on most indicative conditionals, you could contrive a case where it would be like that. Is that whether there is a way, even retrospectively, to question the correctness of the assertion. So you know, even in the case of the Mississippi River boat, uh, there is a way in which retrospectively we can say that both were right or were uh -huh. correct. So in a sense, uh, the, uh, the problem seems to be that you cannot always uh, express the same content of an indicative conditional with a counterfactual conditional afterwards? Is uh -huh. that? Right, yeah, that's that the one thing. Right. That yeah, uh, was yeah. just the point, mm -hmm. I see. But it's also, I mean, it's right, though. I think you could say retrospectively about this case, so, they both were right. Right. So. But then you need to say, but um, what proposition was it mm -hmm. that they both were right about? Don't um, don't tell me what proposition was expressed in their context because um, we're not in that context anymore. I want to know what proposition it is. So the idea that it was a detachable proposition. Um, so you can still assess people for being, but the, the contrast between being right and being justified or reasonable is harder to draw uh, in some cases with a the, with the retrospective assessment. In other cases, it's not. As in Dorothy Edgington's example, it's very you have a very clear distinction, as she recognizes and talks about, between being reasonable and being correct. So it's supposed to be a story where the speaker, the fortune teller, was wholly unreasonable, uh, had no basis, no legitimate basis for saying what she was saying. But it still was true. Well, she doesn't say true. It still was correct. And I want to say true. Yeah, I, I will, if, I, if I can, well, probably we cannot express the same content with a simple conditional afterwards. But we can explain, for example, why the two people uh, were correct, and as they, uh, given what they know, 
uh, in that situation it was correct to say what uh -huh. he said uh -huh. or something like that. So in a way we can refer to the content uh, referring to the previous context. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or something like that. Can, is that correct? Right, I think that's right. The, the, so if we just look at truth values, mm -hmm. then um, you might say what each said was true. Mm -hmm. But I say, well, what did each say? What was the proposition? Uh, that's more difficult. But, uh, and this occurs in, not just in conditional cases, but in a lot of cases. And I think that one of the interesting, um, I mean, our paradigm of context dependence, the easy kind, is pronouns and, and indexicals and things. So you can say, it's very easy. I mean, my saying, I was born in New Jersey, um, is local to me, um, but one can say, well, there's a proposition I gave you when I told you that, something you can take away. You can't use the sentence I used to say it because you'd say something else if you said, quote, I was born in New Jersey. Um, but you have other ways of referring to me, and not only did you acquire some information, but you acquired exactly the information that I gave you. So I expressed a proposition as a function of the context, which included the speaker, and you knew what the context was, and so you got the proposition. So trying to extend that paradigm to richer domains of context dependence is much more difficult. And this comes up with lots of contextualist theories. So um, there's a problem if you think, if you're a contextualist about knowledge, uh, and you change the context in a certain way, it's, it's, uh, it's more difficult to detach the proposition uh, and say, uh, even though you can say when the person claimed to know, they were correct in that context, to say, well, what was the context and what is the proposition in your context? How would you express it? So um, this is a general problem with the sort of fragility of uh, context-dependent expressions. Sometimes the proposition is quite robust, even though the context, contextual connection is, is, is uh, tight, but other times uh, it's, um, it's much more difficult to detach a proposition. So that's, that's the main, main idea. Does it have to do with the distinction you made between justification on the one side and correctness or truth on the other side. Uh -huh. the, is fragility connected to this distinction or not, in your opinion? Yes, well, in the case where, as in the story of the, uh, the gambling uh, riverboat, um, you make it easy by, um, by making all the assumptions, presuppositions that people are making correct. So being justified and being correct um, sort of go together. Um, but uh, there are examples where um, somebody is making a false presupposition and saying something that was justified. Um, given their false presupposition, that the antecedent together with that false presupposition implied the consequence, so um, uh, they were justified and reasonable in making the inference, uh, but the presupposition itself was perhaps a reasonable one, but not a true one. And so then you say, so was what they said literally correct? And sometimes one wants to say no, and other times one wants to say the question doesn't arise, I think, whether they were correct. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Um, thank you. I have rather uh, a question about uh, minor aspect of your talk. So about? Uh, about minor aspect of your uh -huh. talk. Okay. Uh, aside aspect, let's, uh, let's say. So when you was 
introducing the distinction between indicative and uh, counterfactuals, you've mentioned that uh, the first sentence about, uh, about Shakespeare is true, uh -huh. while the second one is not so obvious. Let's uh -huh. say so. Yeah. And then you've added that according to some views on metaphysics of art, it's necessarily that Hamlet was written by by Shakespeare. Yeah. So my question is, doesn't that make the second conditional uh, vacuously true? The um, I mean, this is a good question because it raises um, further issues about the relationship between the indicative, between the epistemic possibilities and the metaphysical uh, possibilities. So. Um, the question, the fact is you can be in a position where you don't know whether uh, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet or not, but you do know that if he did, it's necessary that it was written by him. And if he didn't, it's necessary that it wasn't written by him. Um, so how can I, um, suppose that this is um, true that, that someone else wrote, uh, Shakespeare, that Shakespeare didn't write Hamlet, um, uh, if in fact it's um, false. And of course that's a much more general problem about how we make sense of uh, suppositions or assertions which um, turn out to be um, uh, necessarily false. Uh, and you need a story to tell about that. And it's a general story about and that, and, and this is, of course, connects with Kripke's whole way of distinguishing epistemic from metaphysical um, questions. And all of those issues uh, enter into the distinction all those issues about the difference between epistemic possibilities and exactly how you explain the relationship between epistemic possibilities and metaphysical possibilities, uh, all those issues uh, will play into uh, a more specific way of dealing with these things. But on the surface, at least, um, again, you push deeper, but I, I think um, I'm an advocate of Quine's um, remark at one point that um, uh, the, I mean, the idea that, that you deal at different levels with different problems and sometimes you take for granted concepts you find problematic um, saying uh, we'll have to explain away on a deeper level this but I think the idea that take epistemic possibilities for granted um, on a superficial level um, um, even if in the end we have a, a, a philosophical problem about how you, how you explain what a metaphysically impossible but epistemically possible situation is. What are we, what are we talking about? Because there aren't any, you know. And, and, and. So semantically, in terms of understanding the content of what we say, we want to connect our suppositions and assertions to the world, to the way the world might be. But if they are in fact impossible, there's no straightforward way to do that, and that's the general problem. So it's a good, um, a, a good issue, and it, it connects up with, with a lot of other things. Other questions? So I have one. Uh, coming back to the Sly Pete example. Um, there's one observer that knows both hands in the example. There's no one who knows both things. I'm what sorry. You're saying there is one observer that knows uh, both Sly Pete's hand yes, and, right, and, yeah, and yeah. the opponent's hand. Uh -huh. And he says uh, he knows that Sly Pete has the worst. Worst hand, right. And, yeah. and so he says, uh, uh, 
if Pete calls, uh, if, if, if Pete called, he lost. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that when um, the observer says this, uh, he's sort of taking into um, account the possibility that uh, Pete might uh, act irrationally. Uh -huh. uh, because Pete knows that uh, uh, yeah. what the opponent has. Oh, but no, no the, uh, this, this informant doesn't know that. Uh, this informant doesn't know that. He doesn't know that Pete knows both hands. I thought that in the example, the informant is, uh, that knows both hands signaled to Pete. One informant knows uh -huh. that Pete knows both hands, but doesn't know himself. That is, the informant doesn't know uh, who has the better hand. Okay, one of them. One of them. The other one knows both hands. Oh, but he doesn't know that but Pete... Doesn't know that Pete, that, knows. that Pete knows. So he does, it isn't because he thinks Pete might act irrationally, he thinks that Pete might think he has a winning hand. Oh, I see. So again, it's, it's supposed to be a, an example of, of um, partial but overlapping information. And if you have partial information, um, uh, that justifies the adding the other piece of information as a supposition, and then you have both pieces, and then you can draw the conclusion, and the other person has another information, and he adds uh, the supposition and gets a different, because uh, the supposition okay. is false. So, but you quoted this example as uh, a case that is somehow supporting, or at least going into the direction of uh, the conditional assertion yeah, view. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Um, and so this seems to be a particular case in which uh, the proposition expressed by each observer in saying, if Pete called, he lost, if Pete called, he won, uh, seems, to de seems to be dependent on the information state of the observer, yeah, yeah. of each observer, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, and So, w one question is, in the case of the propositional account, would you explain the difference between uh, the proposition expressed by saying that um, they assume the different notion of what is most similar to uh -huh. the actual world because of their uh, state of information? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, good. No, so the example is extremely cleverly um, contrived to make it, try to make it the case that the context in which each of the informants says what they say is the same. Mm -hmm. Because the context is the shared information between the informant and the narrator, the one who's getting told this information. So the story says the narrator doesn't even know which message, he gets a written message, comes from which person. Mm -hmm. So these two messages arrive in exactly the same context. And that was Gibbard's reason for saying you can't get out of this with contextual. So, and it does raise a, a, a very good challenge, and I think the the upshot is we need to add, and this is something that's not clear in the paper that I, I wrote about this ago, but it needs to be added um, to make the point, nail the point down, that um, the conditionals, the indicative conditionals are to be interpreted prospectively. Um, that is, what the narrator who receives the message says is, what must, what, the, what, con, what must this posterior context be to make this message correct? 
So I say, I trust this person, and his message is based on his knowledge. So he is proposing that we eliminate the possibility in which he called and won, or the possibility in which he called he lost. What must he know um, to justify that uh, proposal? And I will adjust the context in such a way as to make what he said true. And um, he does that for the first message, then he goes back to the original context and does it for the second message. And uh, as a result, eliminates two possibilities. So, but that's an extra twist in the story that, that you need, and I, I think that's... So it, 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 you're raising a... I mean, there is a, a problem with the assumption that the context is, is the same. And that's, so it's not only the fragility of, of the context, but it's that the... Um, I mean, the way Gibbard would put it, and the way I put it originally in accepting his, his result, is the... Um, you have to already know what the person is saying is true in order to understand it. But it's like, you know, you're in a dark room and you say, where, you, where are you? And you say, I'm over here. Well, that's not informative, over, I'm over here. That would be true wherever you were, right? But when I hear you say it, I know where you're saying it from because I can tell the direction of a sound. So, so it's that in order to interpret your assertion, I have to know um, what your assertion is saying, namely, where are you? Uh, so that's a very special case of an assertion, but it works. And it, uh, and it's the same kind of thing going on with the conditional in a more systematic way. Does that make sense? So, but what I wanted to know was whether, I mean, you actually think that the way you would solve the Sly Pete problem would be by allowing uh, that the similarity relation, the selection function may be different from yeah, yeah. speaker to uh, speaker. Right, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. So, uh, okay, so the, if I can go on. So the, the, my next question is, the conditional assertion account certainly introduces the matter of um, uh, degree of belief when, when you're making an assertion. So in a sense, it seems to be more amenable to deal with this problem. Um, on the other hand, not every version of the uh, conditional assertion account would be able to deal with it. Uh, because if uh, uh, the norm that regulates conditional assertion is that the degree of belief shared by the conversational participants uh, must be high, uh, then the slight bit example would still be a problem also for the yeah, conditional yeah, assertion, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's an extra step there that the conditional assertion account has to make in order to, in order to take care of this example. Good, good, right. Okay. Uh, well, that the propositional account needs to make an extra move, right, yeah. So, yeah. right, and, and the, in general, one of the problems with, um, that arise with some of these examples is a conflict between I mean, there's a question about the individual speaker's beliefs, and then there's the common uh, beliefs. So um, the context is supposed to be the, um, uh, the shared information, but the basis for making a conditional uh, assertion is the individual's uh, beliefs. So, it may be shared in the prior state that probably Pete had a winning hand or something like that. And yet somebody else knows probably he has a losing hand and he says that. Then, it change, then the probabilities change. And the way that, I mean, it's a, 
the notion of the interaction of individual degrees of belief and sort of some shared degrees of belief is a, a problem lots of people now are thinking about, but it doesn't, uh, I mean, it, um, it's, in, in my notion of common ground, I never sort of had a notion of a common degrees of belief, but one has to bring that into to the story as well. So that's, that's right. And in general, whether it's degrees of belief or not, I mean, the idea that um, my epistemic priorities uh, may be, it's not only my individual beliefs are different from yours, but they may, my epistemic priorities may be different from yours. And then our, what are our shared epistemic priorities? And that's when, in particular, when communication involves ex these epistemic notions, not explicit talk about belief and knowledge, but ex things that express belief and, and knowledge, such as epistemic modals, then you're going to get uh, lots of uh, potential, um, I mean, lots of problems with exactly how to fit, fit together the, uh, the individual's overall epistemic situation with the, with the contact, the, the, pre the presumed uh, expectations in, in, in the context. <laughs> And again, I, I think, I mean, there's a lot of focus now in, the, in literature, linguistics, semantics literature, and uh, pragmatics and semantics about epistemic modal statements, might and must, epistemic must and epistemic might. But indicative conditional is, a, um, is an epistemic modal. And then, so all the same problems arise uh, for them. And, uh, and again, just as in we have counterfactuals and indicatives, we have uh, modal notions, necessity, must, an interpretation of must and couldn't and, uh, and so on, which are so-called circumstantial and those that are epistemic. And, and the relationship between those is it parallels the, uh, the relationship between indicative and subjunctive conditions. And, uh, okay. Other questions? So just to be clear on the, the kind of uh, inference that the narrator is making. So, uh, so you said you don't even, he doesn't need, he even need uh, to know, uh, know we, who one is speaking. You know? So one is, is um, writing the, uh, so who is, who is writing which uh, note, right? So, right. You, so, and that's, I mean, so that's assuming that the kind of inference that it is making uh, uh, is is like on the ground of the of uh, the conditional being interpreted as a as a material conditional or, or even in the other version because I mean it looks like that so there are two kind of uh, scenario I think here one in, in which uh, uh, the narrator figure out the relation between uh, the epistemic situation of the two informant. Uh, even mm -hmm. if he doesn't know which one is which, doesn't matter, and compare with the, the, the note, and then derive the conclusion that uh, Pete um, folded, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one in which uh, it just look at the conditional, and it says, oh, they can't both be right if the antecedent is correct, so the antecedent must be false. Right, so yeah. Pete, so yeah. I, it looks to me that those are two different patterns of inferences, and, yeah. and it's not clear to me which one uh, one should, I mean, which right. one. Right, good, so, good, okay. yeah, no. Um, so, the, of course, you can consider the situation where he, he just got one of the messages and say, how would he reason then? Um, um, so the one form of reasoning is um, what must um, I, tr I don't know who this came from but I trust both of them so I trust the person who sent this message um, they are what is this what is um, I mean they are in a position to rule out 
when you say if A then B, you are in a position to rule out the possibility that both A and not B. Um, um, so, um, um, how do we explain, I mean it's clear enough that's the way he reasons. He says he ruled out that possibility so therefore I can rule out that possibility. Yeah. But that story would be right if it were the material conditional yeah. or any other um, uh, conditional. And so your form of argument um, the, you see the one message, you rule out the one possibility, you see the other message, you rule out the other, and you're left with the, with the third. Um, but then one can ask, how can one fit, if one's giving a propositional analysis of the kind that I want to give, how do you fit this in? How, uh, that, how do you explain why that conditional is, is uh, faulted? He comes to learn that. And you have to say, well, he, he learns that um, um, in the context as the speaker proposes it should be, is recommending that it be, this conditional is true. So I say, what must the world, what must the context be in order for that to be correct? It must be a context in which this possibility is ruled out. Um, so uh, it's right that the explanation will take, if you sort of fit it to the, the propositional analysis, the explanation is, is, uh, takes a slightly different form, but it leads to the same um, conclusion. Okay. Now what's made clear by the example and the special care he took to make it have the features that it had, is that while with effort you can add some bells and whistles that make the propositional analysis right, what's the point? It's so much simpler just to say, um, when you say if A then B, you're saying um, um, assume A, um, rule out all but B, then add A back in again. That's all you're saying. Right? It's, it's just a conditional assertion account. And that's right, I think. So, so one needs some reason why one should impose a propositional analysis on that kind of example. And the reason is, that is the argument, we want, we want to give, we want to help to explain not just this example on one extreme, but we want to be able to explain a range of examples, including some where the, um, where um, the propositional account does a better job, and in particular one wants to explain um, intermediate cases, cases where the counterfactual seems to, um, we want to explain why the counterfactual in some cases seems to be a retrospective statement of what was said before, seems to be the same thing. So it's this, the way we identify contents across possible contexts is, um, is, um, a move in the direction of a more stable content. And that's, um, so if you focus too much on one, um, an example that's designed to be at one extreme of the range of possibilities, then you, um, um, uh, then you say, well, it, it, we, we could, the, conditional assertion account by itself would be simpler, or the material conditional account for that kind of case would be simpler, but, um, but, um, uh, but we want to explain a range of cases. And we'll okay. see more how, how when, we, when we look at some other kind of okay. things. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. More questions? Then. 
Maybe we can stop here then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.